Uh, Steph is with us this morning. And, Steph, talking about uh, the possibility of a no-deal Brexit and what that might mean yes. for British business. Because, actually, in the background, there's been some trade deals going on. So mm. what I wanted to do is just give a bit of an explanation of what's been happening behind the scenes while all the shenanigans has been, obviously, going on mm -hmm. with the politics. Uh, morning, everyone. Yeah, just to give you the background of this, the European Union has been making deals with the rest of the world for many years. And it has around 40 trade agreements with more than 70 countries. And they range from your big economies like Japan and South Korea to your very small ones, such as the Dominica and the Grenadines as well. Now, they are free trade agreements, meaning there are no charges for bringing products across a border. And there's no limit on how much trade you can do, making, of course, trade between the two countries as easy as possible. Now, almost 11% of the UK's total trade comes from the countries that have these EU trade agreements. So, of course, we would lose these deals if we leave the EU with no deal. So, the UK government's been trying to replicate the EU's trade agreements, which, to be fair, is no easy task. They can take up to 10 years, for example, the Canada-EU free trade agreement, because what they're bringing together is two very complex economies. You can imagine the complexity of an economy internally with all the services and goods that, that are produced. Here you're trying to address all aspects of economic activity within those two countries and to create a bridge between them. They're often hugely political issues, uh, which is what takes a long time. So it's tricky and time-consuming, but so far, eight deals have been struck. So there's a Switzerland deal agreed last month uh, with trade with that country worth around £32 billion last year. This deal is particularly important for the motor industry. Then there are some Caribbean deal uh, trade with those countries is worth around £2.5 billion a year. So, for example, last year, all of St Lucia's banana exports and two-thirds of Jamaican sugarcane exports went to the UK. We also have a deal with Chile uh, with trade of things like fruit, nuts and drink worth about 1.8 billion and the government says the deal uh, with Chile will help to protect parts of the UK's wine industry. Now these are all important deals but the challenge of course will be get an agreement with big countries like the US and Japan. I think the UK government has try been trying to build up that capacity but it takes time. You need hundreds of people who have experience in the specific policy aspects of trade agreements and they can be broken down into about 25 different chapters. So on, uh, for teams like the EU, they've had people working on these agreements for decades. It takes time to replace that kind of expertise. So, some important deals under the belt, but of course, uh, still plenty to be done and lots of challenges ahead, which could, of course, disrupt world trade. It's interesting to see what's going on. You think about holidays, Nat? What, the sunshine? Well, and also the fact that Steph's here is all about hire car oh, yes. when, you, oh, yeah. when you go abroad. Um, and this, it's going to be a bit clearer because it can... I, we, we've just, I've just booked some for a holiday this summer. It can be really confusing online, yeah, can't it, when you're it trying can. to find out where to go and what to do. Yeah, and also the cost of it. Mm. So that's something that the competition authorities have been looking into. They've been trying to uh, work out whether the hire car companies are actually transparent enough for the cost, and they've been looking into this since 2015. And in particular, they focused on five of the biggest uh, car hire companies that you can see there. Uh, and the Competition and Markets Authority kind of highlighted them as ones who need to do better on things like being upfront about what the charges are so you don't get to the desk and then have a load of extras or get to the end of your online booking and have extra costs. And also just making it easier for actually people to be able to complain about any problems that they might have with mm -hmm. the car as well. So the companies did actually promise to do this, but it's taken a while for them to get to the point where the competition authorities are happy with them. Uh, what if you get there um, and, you know, it's not exactly like you want the car for you. It's yeah. not the car you want. Well, I mean, there's loads, of, there's loads of issues around it. Actually, one of the biggest problems is the damage to the car. So, you know, that's one of the biggest complaints is about people who feel they've been charged for damage that they haven't created. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the really obvious thing to say is just get as much evidence as you can. You know, just when you get the car, go wild with your phone and just take as many photos as you can. A bit boring in your holiday photo album, but worth it yes. when you get to the end. And then just take photos at the end as well just and keep them until you, you know, you've, you, you've got to the end of the whole process because that can be a problem. Um, other things as well is, uh, you know, look at the excess when you're booking the car hire deal. Mm. 
don't necessarily go for the cheapest because the excess might be really high. Right. So maybe it might be worth paying a little bit more and actually the excess is a bit cheaper. That's it's another thing as well. Insurance, don't necessarily go with the car hire's own insurance. Um, you know, look at the ind independent providers as well because they could be cheaper. And I know, Dan, one of the problems you were saying was about you th you've got insurance, but then you get there and they try to get you to get more. It's happened the last three or four times. I've yeah. come to my mum and dad as well. And you think you have to... My mum was in the situation where she actually called and said, do I need, do I need this? And you don't actually need it because yeah. you've already got insurance with the... And also the other thing to look out for, I think, is when you when it's all listed on a website, it's where you collect it from. Yeah. Because often you can get a cheaper deal, but actually you've got like a 10, 15 minute walk to get it and they're not actually yeah, located in the in the airport when you get never there. Never good with loads of cases, is yeah. it? And the other things as well is the kind of hidden charges. Mm. So, for example, fuel. Does the tank have to be full when mm -hmm. you give the car back? If you don't give it back full, they might charge you a really inflated price for the fuel that they fill it up with as well. Um, should you stand your ground, Steph, if, if, you, if you're in a dispute with them? And what, what sort of yeah. rights have you got? Yeah, yeah, you, you should stand your ground. So, for example, if you get the wrong, you, you know, if you're given the wrong car, if you've been told it's damaged when you don't think it has and you have evidence to prove it, that there are formal complaints you can make. You, should, you know, they, they are, they can't break the consumer trade act mm. with it. They have to give you what you've paid for. And if you can prove that you didn't, you know, cause this damage or anything. And then, of course, you've got every right to put in a formal complaint. Watch out for maximum number of miles as well, because sometimes oh, right. they'll say, if you go over this many miles in the car, then we'll charge you as well. There's so it's all those to watch extra out things. For. I know you, you could spend all day Very just trying to, just to take away. Go wild with your phone. Yeah. <laughs> That's what